Good evening. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for the program this evening. My name is Michael Scott, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The SAB is a bipartisan group. As a member of the SAB, I get access to many great opportunities by being involved with the Institute. If you are a KU student that is interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this evening's event, if you would like to know more about our guest, the event itself, upcoming Institute events, and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the event description below. At the end of this evening's event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guests. Please email your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. And now, please join me in welcoming Director of the Institute, Bill Lacey. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate that. Michael's my research assistant, by the way, and he does a great job for me. Welcome, everyone, to, as Michael said, the third uh, presidential lecture series event tonight. This one is titled The Last Four Years, Breaking Precedent. I'd like to thank the History and Political Science Departments at KU for their co-sponsorship of our series. Now I'd like to welcome our guest. Our guest is the first permanent director of the Dole Institute of Politics. He's a great friend of the Institute. He'll have a new, brand new biography on President Ford out about a year from now. Everyone, please welcome presidential historian Richard Norton Smith. Richard, glad you could join us again tonight. I'm delighted to be asked. Thank you, Bill. Yes. Tonight, Richard, we're going to do something that historians usually don't like to do. We're going to talk about what <laughs> happened the last four years. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about that? I can tell you a little bit about why historians, as a rule, don't like to do it. Um, there's a reason why they refer to journalism as the first draft of history. In many ways, we're still uh, dealing with the first draft of history, uh, arguably, not only with the most recent president, but I would say going back a president or two beyond that. Um, that's because it takes time, particularly as we are tonight, uh, when you're dealing with a controversial, uh, even polarizing figure, uh, the fact of the matter is emotions are running very strong, pro and con, uh, and it takes time for those emotions to cool a bit. It takes time for perspective to form. It takes time for a president's papers to become available. It takes time for those around the president to speak candidly, uh, perhaps more so uh, than they were willing or able to do while uh, while uh, in office. Uh, there are a whole, a whole bunch of factors. And of course, let's face it, uh, we, we assess presidential performance um, not alone, but as part of a continuum. Uh, the fact is that presidents, however much we like to think that January 20th, every fourth year begins the American experiment over again. Uh, the fact is that history uh, is a continuum and presidents deal with many of the same issues. I mean, how presidents, for example, uh, have dealt for 50 years with the Middle East, how for 40 years they dealt with the Cold War, uh, how they deal with economic uh, distress, um, how they will deal going forward with global warming. Uh, for example, all of those are issues that transcend any one president or, or a presidential term. And so we, we need more than one term, uh, the distance um, and, um, and the events uh, with which to compare one president's performance perhaps against another. So all of those are reasons why I shouldn't take you up on your uh, invitation um, and uh, step over the abyss into offering an opinion, particularly, um, let's be honest, we're dealing with a president um, who was controversial to begin with and who is uh, um, arguably more so since the events of January 6th. Well, let's get into it then, Richard. Um, 
I found a very interesting quotation from uh, four years ago from Selena Zito in The Atlantic. She wrote, when he makes claims like this, the press takes him literally, but not seriously. His supporters take him seriously, but not literally. Do you think this accurately describes how people have different, strongly different opinions about Donald Trump? Uh, to be quite honest with you, Bill, I'm not sure if I know what that quote means. Uh, people have strong opinions about Donald Trump for a number of reasons. Um, I think a lot of people who are drawn to Trump uh, are, uh, are supporters, not because of any particular legislative program, um, but because they believe that Donald Trump is someone who speaks for them. Um, there is certainly an element of what has become known as owning the libs. Um, let, let's face it, that's, that's part of what we're, we're dealing with. Um, Donald Trump is an unconventional president in a lot of ways. He's a symbolic figure in a lot of ways. And people who um, despise Trump despise him because, uh, not because, well, they, they may indeed object to specific programs or promises made or, or, or unkept, um, but they are as inclined, for the most part, to look upon Trump um, uh, in symbolic, non-legislative, arguably non-conventional terms. They, they see him um, as someone turning the clock back, they, uh, they see him as someone um, in all candor uh, who is hostile to uh, much of the progress, racial, environmental uh, progress that has been made in this country over the last 50 years. Um, just as uh, many of those who support him are, are drawn to him because they see, um, perhaps curiously, uh, given his own life story, but they nevertheless project onto him. They see him as, at the very least, a, a, a champion of what they think of as uh, traditional values um, of, of an America that perhaps um, they tend to, 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 to glorify, um, an, an America that um, began to disappear in the 1960s and um, uh, has probably been been um, um, overrun in many ways by the popular culture. Um, and I think there are elements that have nothing to do with Donald Trump per se, uh, and there are elements that are exclusively a, a, a result of Trump's personality, Trump's methods, uh, and yes, Trump's politics. Um, the, the one thing it's, I will say it's, it's interesting. Uh, sort of circle back to your original question. Another reason why I think people um, ought to be leery of um, snap judgments, in effect. I saw a poll recently from a very reputable firm, and it was interesting. 46% of those polled said they thought Donald Trump was the worst president in American history. 26% uh, of the same sample, thought that Barack Obama was the worst president in American history. Now, what that tells me is, one, uh, each in his own way, coming from arguably opposite ends of the political spectrum and with profoundly uh, different priorities and, and personal styles and personal stories, um, what they have in common is they are polarizing uh, figures. Um, the other thing that that tells me is, again, um, how intense emotions are right now. I think they would have been in any event, but I think they have been exacerbated by the controversy, self-generated controversy over the election, its results, uh, the events of January 6th, the court cases, uh, you name it. So it was as... I think is true of much of the Trump presidency. Um, it was a messy way to end the story. And, and arguably the story is not ended. Another reason why I think it's, um, we should be loath to, uh, to, to form 
anything like permanent judgments at this point is we don't know what the rest of the story is. And I don't mean just whether Donald Trump runs for president again in 2024 or whether he, in effect, continues to call the shots in the modern Republican Party. We, those, are, those are large, unanswered questions. But there's obviously there's much more to the, uh, um, to, the, to the story that has yet to be written. Um, just this week, of course, the Supreme Court uh, basically ruled that uh, uh, Trump and his organization have got to turn over uh, eight years of, of personal income taxes to uh, prosecutors in New York City. We know that the state attorney general of New York, we know that, uh, that uh, law enforcement uh, officials in, in Georgia are, are all, uh, in effect, uh, pursuing leads. Uh, we can only imagine uh, where, where that may lead, but clearly that is part of the story as well. Richard, how would you describe President Trump's leadership style? Well, this is, of course, part of the <laughs> of what is polarizing. Um, let me step back just a minute and 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 in effect credit him uh, because I've said some harsh things. Um, one thing that I think people uh, will tend to agree on, who agree on very little else, it's hard to deny that Donald Trump is a consequential president. Um, that's a value-free uh, judgment in a way. But, but what it says is, and this is by no means uh, universally applicable to, uh, uh, to the rest of the uh, presidential club, um, they're not all historically consequential um, as attested to the fact that probably um, some of our viewers, even those who are history buffs, might have trouble uh, naming half of them. Uh, the fact of the matter is Donald Trump <clears throat> has left an imprint. Um, certainly, uh, um, well, for example, um, if you look at the federal judiciary, of something like 200 judges, uh, of federal judges, uh, who uh, were appointed during uh, uh, four years in office, uh, three members of the United States Supreme Court. I mean, some presidents never get a Supreme Court no nomination. Uh, and, and Donald Trump clearly has uh, moved the court to the right. Um, it, again, remains to be seen. Uh, that's more of the story that uh, has yet to be written. But as it is, it too will be factored in uh, as people form estimates of, of, of Trump's historical um, significance. Uh, as a leader, he defied convention, um, for example. Uh, most people, um, particularly when they're elected uh, in a controversial uh, situation or by a narrow margin, um, you know, politics 101 is you spend the next four years not only tending to your base, but trying to expand it. Politics famously is a game of, of multiplication, um, not subtraction. In some quarters, apparently, it's a game of division. And um, I think that's been one of the ways in which Trump uh, certainly uh, had a uniquely personal uh, leadership style. He, uh, I can't think of an instance in four years where he made any, certainly any sustained effort uh, to try to uh, to reach out to quote the other side, with I tell you one one important exception, and this is also part of the record, uh, some of the criminal uh, justice uh, reform measures um, that he um, signed off on, uh, reportedly at the behest of his son-in-law Jared Kushner, but but nevertheless that's that's important and it's interesting. Um, one of the um, the numbers that did budge in November in, in an electorate that is famously polarized, um, the fact is that Donald Trump did better, measurably better, 
four years later than he did in 2016 among non-white voters. Um, He got 19% of black men, which, by the way, is the highest percentage for a Republican since Bob Dole in 1996. Um, He also did uh, notably better among some Hispanics, certainly uh, enough to carry Florida convincingly, and also a significant uh, improvement uh, in South Texas. Um, So it's interesting. Um, There are clearly segments of the electorate that find Trump's line in the sand approach uh, to politics to be to be very attractive. Um, we cannot overlook the fact, for all the controversies, um, and and I would argue, for all of the missed opportunities, uh, for uh, I think a mismanaged response to coronavirus. Um, anyway, uh, you, you can go on. But the fact remains that uh, Trump got 11 million more votes um, this time around than he did four years ago. Um, clearly, there are a lot of Americans who are responded to his, uh, his style of leadership. A lot of Americans uh, would agree with you. Um... Uh, on the, you know, the conservatism and the judiciary, the criminal justice. Uh, many would argue that he did a lot of, uh, of uh, unregulating of the economy and created a great economy before the pandemic. So there are things that, uh, you know, anyone can point to. What about failures? You touched upon the pandemic, but talk about some of the other things that you feel President Trump could have well, done a better job on. I, I, this is, again, a classic instance of, of why it's premature, in effect, to be passing judgment. You mentioned uh, deregulation. Uh, it really depends, uh, you know, uh, what side of the coin you're on. There is no doubt at all uh, Wall Street liked uh, the Trump presidency for the most part. Uh, it certainly uh, reveled in the, uh, in the deregulatory uh, atmosphere that uh, that Trump ushered in. Uh, on the other hand, there are many people who feel just as strongly that um, it represented a backtrack uh, on particularly environmental protections. Um, and of course, uh, the fact that uh, we unilaterally uh, withdrew from the, the Paris uh, Climate Accord, um, that we indeed, in a larger sense, um, seemed uh, willing, even eager, to cut some of the most um, long-standing uh, ties with allies in Europe. Uh, for example, um, we were told that uh, a new day had dawned um, with uh, American relations to North Korea, but uh, aside from a few spectacular photo ops, um, uh, there's no evidence uh, of any uh, softening on the part of the uh, North Korean regime or, or any uh, decrease in, in their uh, nuclear weapons program. Um, we withdrew from the, um, the uh, Iranian deal in terms of uh, um, restraining the Iranians from developing uh, an atomic bomb uh, who knows what the uh, what the long term consequences are of that? Uh, this administration is now attempting uh, to um, to put the genie back in the bottle, uh, as it were. Um, so you know there are and and by the way on the economy, uh, yeah, you can say you know what um, things were going fine until a year ago and then. The roof caved in, and you know, um, should should that be counted against the man who happened to be under the roof when it caved in? Well, um, it depends on. Uh, he's certainly not responsible for the roof caving in, but the fact that it has taken so very long 
to 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 put even a, a top on where the roof used to be. Um, that um, we just this week observed um, a, a tragic milestone, uh, and the fact that five hundred thousand Americans uh, have been officially counted as victims of COVID. I mean, and most people think that that's probably uh, an undercount. We are um, almost certainly going to um, do something that I never could have imagined. Um, and I think most historians could not have imagined. We are going to surpass the number of deaths that uh, we counted in the, in the 1918-19 pandemic, which uh, until now has been uh, regarded as the, the worst of its kind of, uh, in, in American history. So, um, and even before the spring of, of uh, last year, uh, if you step back uh, and look at the numbers, the, the, the fact is that uh, whether it was unemployment or, or inflation, um, in many ways, the Trump administration was a continuation uh, albeit from, you know, with, with some very different policies, a continuation of the long accelerating economic comeback uh, that occurred during the eight years of Barack Obama. Of course, they had a long, long way to come back uh, after the, uh, the collapse of, of 2008. Well, let me... Um... Let me ask you kind of a political question, Richard. Uh, it's a demonstrable fact that, uh, and I think Gallup is the one that said this, that President Trump wound up with the poorest average job rating of any president in history. Uh, but President Trump, uh, who was politically very successful in 16, and you pointed out some of the successes he had since then, uh, but he... He lost the House, the White House, and the Senate in four years. Had that been done before? Well, Barack Obama lost, uh, you know, after the Democrats regained Congress in 2006. And, and then came the, the, the year of the Tea Party, remember, in 2010. Ironically, the year that Obamacare was passed and... Um, and at the time, at the inception of the program, when it was an abstraction, when it was a, a vague sort of conjecture, and to many people, uh, it was easily uh, represented or misrepresented as an intrusion by Washington on you know the sacred relationship between patient and doctor. Um, the same sort of thing that was said about Medicare uh, before it was passed uh, uh, over 50 years ago. Uh, ironically, um, you can in some ways sum up the, uh, the fortunes of the Democratic Party over the last 10 years by contrasting uh, the numbers uh, for Obamacare in 2010 when it was brand new and in 2020 when, when many Democrats basically ran their whole campaign or based uh, much of their campaign on the issue of uh, keeping um, and, uh, if anything, strengthening Obamacare. How did President Trump view social media differently than other past presidents? Well, here is, uh, again, this is something that I think, whether you, uh, again, however you feel about the message being sent, there is no doubt that um, um, Donald Trump was a transformative president in terms of how he communicated uh, to the American people. Uh, we think of FDR and it's an inseparable um, connection. He and he and the, and the radio. Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, you know, and the televised press conferences. Uh, Ronald Reagan and the uh, uh, Oval Office televised address. Um, all of them in their own way, very different men, very different styles, very different agendas. Uh, but they all succeeded because the next day uh, they were the chief topic of conversation around the water cooler. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, whatever the equivalent of the water cooler is uh, in 2020, that Donald Trump succeeded in his 
uh, overriding objective, which was to make every news cycle as much as possible about him. Um, and, and he did it with Twitter more than anything else. I mean, this was a president who mastered the social media uh, in a way, I think, equivalent to FDR's mastery of radio and Reagan's uh, of, of television. Um, the fact is we communicate by different means, different technologies. Um, Trump understood that. He understood it before he was elected. Um, and he certainly exploited it uh, for the most part, very successfully, uh, while he was in office. So, so, so that's certainly one of the uh, legacies uh, that he leaves behind. Like every other legacy, it will be hotly debated, but no one can deny uh, the accomplishment. What do you think, uh, Richard, that President Trump changed about the presidency? That I literally do not know. Uh, I mean, I, I, and and the. It's a it's a fair question. But. The most obvious way to answer it is. In effect, to counter and, and ask what he didn't change, about the presidency, um, in his again, it's obviously very early, but if you look at the Biden White House, um, it's a more diverse. Uh, workforce than than ever before. Um, the president and those around him have have made a, a deliberate effort. But uh, if you, if you look beyond that, guess what? We've gone back to a daily briefing that looks like a daily briefing. Um, the president uses Twitter, but by no means uh, in, in the same way or frequency uh, as his predecessor. Um, Policy-wise, forget surface appearances, um, the policies, we've rejoined the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Um, there are efforts underway to try to uh, reopen talks, as I mentioned, with Iran. There is clearly uh, an effort uh, being made to repair what is perceived to be a damage um, with uh, the NATO allies. Um, the whole relationship with Russia uh, remains um, somewhat up in the air, but, but that is not much of a change, uh, really, from the last four years. I mean, you can go down the list. Um, well, we're, we're looking at a $1.9 trillion COVID relief package, um, the largest, I think, the largest single appropriation in, in American history. Um, and in many ways reflective of what you might call New Deal liberalism. I mean, uh, Joe Biden is, uh, uh, makes no, no secret of his admiration for FDR or the kind of emergency uh, crisis-driven leadership that, uh, that he provided in the 30s and, for that matter, during the war in the 40s. Um, and um, that's the model, if you will, uh, perhaps more than any other. Uh, as we said last week, he's also, I think, learned from some of the mistakes um, that were made um, from some of the misplaced efforts at, uh, at bipartisanship. Um, and, um, well, but the model seems to be go big. And, and that... Um, May very well. For example, just today, we're hearing about efforts to uh, raise corporate taxes, uh, not back to old levels. They're talking about 28%, I believe. Uh, and, and there's no word yet about um, personal rates. But um, clearly, there is an attempt on the economic front to undo. Um, at least parts of the Trump agenda. If you remember, in, in 2016, uh, the presidential candidate Trump talked a lot about a middle class tax cut. Well, there was a tax cut, and it was a big one, but I don't think anyone would argue that it benefited 
uh, primarily or really to any degree, um, the middle class. And so, so I think when, when you talk about things that uh, Trump did that changed the presidency, um, it's hard at this stage to, to, to think of much that one can predict will stay changed if, if, uh, if you know what I'm, I'm saying. Now, you know what? Guess what? All bets could be off next year if, if uh, history repeats itself, if anything like 2010 occurs, if the Republicans take back one or both houses of Congress, which is entirely uh, possible uh, given historical trends uh, during a presidential uh, uh, midterm election. Um, and, and, you know, all of that, all of that um, um, could um, be erased in a moment. That said, um, and aside from the judicial appointments that I referred to earlier, which are certainly not insignificant, um, and, and which will, and in fact, are already having impact, for example, on policy. I mean, the, if Congress is unwilling to act, more and more you find judges either forced to or eager to, in effect, uh, step into their place and become at least adjunct policymakers. So it matters uh, if, uh, if uh, a majority of, uh, of judges on the federal bench bear the imprimatur of the Federalist Society um, or if they're um, endorsed by Chuck Schumer. Richard, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, we talked about social media and you talked about how that had been something very consequential that President Trump has, has done. Are there other tactics that he's used that you think will be used by future presidents as, as they try to run the country? I hope not. I want to go. That was that. pretty. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty direct. That's... Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, how would you describe um, President Trump being unconventional? Just go through us, you know, a few items that you think caused him to have a very unconventional presidency. Well, you always begin with, you know, um, with personality and indeed with character. Uh, character defines personality, character defines um, performance, whatever the job. Uh, it's certainly uh, um, the, the man whose name graces the Dole Institute is Exhibit A. Uh, and, um, and everyone's got their own personality, their own character, their own flaws, their own strengths. Um, I think Donald Trump would be the first to tell you that he wasn't a politician. Um, he wore that as a badge of honor. And there's no doubt that there were, there were and are a great many Americans uh, who voted for him precisely because they believed him. Um, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole line about draining the swamp, again, we could, we could debate um, whether it was carried out or not. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a very appealing, you know, it's the appeal of the outsider. And, and isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it ironic that a self-proclaimed billionaire um, and um, a hotel magnet tycoon um, star of a television series um, should credibly present himself to millions of Americans as as an outsider. I think that is a secret to his appeal. Um, of course, being an outsider traditionally, conventionally, means you think of um, uh, Jimmy Carter was an outsider when he was elected president. Ronald Reagan was an outsider when he was elected president. And, and, and each in his own way tried to compensate for that fact. Uh, Reagan, I would argue, very successfully. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the amount of time he spent courting Congress, and not only Republicans, but critically 
uh, Southern Democrats, conservative. They were conservative Democrats in those days. They were Southern Democrats in those days, uh, enough to form a majority under some circumstances in the House of Representatives. Um, and um, the Reagans actually were accepted in Washington. I mean, you, you, you know better than I, but I mean, they, they made themselves uh, at home in Washington, and yet it was part of Reagan's political magic, you know, suspension of disbelief that six or seven years into his presidency, he could still present himself uh, to Americans as a as an outsider to Washington. Um, well, Donald Trump had that quality compounded. Where it became, I would argue, problematic was, um, in addition to being an outsider, um, there was an element of, of, well, how many times did I hear President Ford or Bob Dole uh, say a variation of the line, you know, I don't have enemies, I have adversaries. Uh, and, um, you know, you don't have to be terribly nostalgic uh, to remember a time in Washington when um, famously Reagan and Tip O'Neill uh, would uh, fight my cats and dogs until six o'clock um, and then uh, they thought nothing of kicking their feet up and, and having a drink and swapping Irish stories. Um, there was none of that in the, in the Trump era and I think there was a very he didn't start it. Let's be fair. Um, Trumpism, I think, would exist without Trump. But the polarization, the bitterness, um, the yes enmity, not just disagreement about ideas, but questioning people's motives and even their patriotism. Um, no one man is uh, wholly responsible for that. But I would argue that, um, that Donald Trump exploited it, um, and I think very profitably, most of the time. President Trump didn't accept the election results, and he never conceded to President Biden. Uh, is there any precedent for that in uh, presidential history, Richard? Not in recent times. You have to go back 150 years. Interesting enough, there was another impeached president, Andrew Johnson, who uh, despised Ulysses Grant. The feeling was mutual. And on Inauguration Day, 1869, uh, the story goes uh, that Johnson wasn't going to attend. And then at the last minute, he decided he would attend. And at that point, Grant didn't really want to, you know, pick him up in his carriage and and go down Pennsylvania Avenue with him. Uh, and it's not clear even now, Grant may have changed his mind and been willing to go through with the, uh, uh, the ritualistic uh, handover of power. Um, of course, ironically, Andrew Johnson is the only American president. We all know John Quincy Adams is the only president who was an ex-president who was elected to the House. Andrew Johnson was elected to the Senate from Tennessee. Um, he came back to Washington. The Senate, of course, the same body that had uh, come within one vote of convicting him on the impeachment charges just a few years earlier. Um, uh, he died before he could he could take his seat. But um, that's the last time that a president deliberately absented himself. It did happen. Uh, there's something in the in the Yankee blood, maybe that both John Adams and his son. John Quincy Adams uh, stayed away from the inaugurations, respectively, of Thomas Jefferson and um, Andrew Jackson. Um, again, there was a, a lot of uh, bad blood um, between all four men, um, which accounts for um, uh, the display of bad sportsmanship, if you will. But, you know, the, the, the overwhelming tradition there have been a number of inaugurations when, uh, quite frankly, that ride 
which is only a mile down Pennsylvania Avenue, must seem like forever. Um, you know, FDR and Herbert Hoover in March of 1933, that was not exactly a laugh riot. Um, uh, they were going through the motions, uh, and to their credit, uh, they, they went through the motions because they understood the symbolism of a peaceful transfer of presidential authority uh, in what was even then, I think, the world's oldest republic, uh, was larger than the, uh, the very real, very intense personal animosities that existed between the two men. Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower, uh, it was pretty heavy weather uh, in that limousine that day, um, going to uh, Ike's first inauguration. Uh, there was no love lost between Dwight Eisenhower and uh, the successor he, he referred to as Little Ward. Uh, Little Boy Blue um, in uh, 1961, and uh, certainly Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter uh, probably w would not have chosen to be in each other's company at that particular time if they had uh, a constitutional alternative. But, um, you know, they, they went through the motion. And I have to say, and again, I'm, I'm biased. You mentioned my book on Ford. Um, Ford and Jimmy Carter... Uh, long before Election Day, as is often the case, uh, even men of, uh, of even temperament like, like Ford and Carter discover all sorts of hidden uh, deficiencies in their opponent long before Election Day. Um, something about uh, running against someone for president will do that. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, Jimmy Carter famously, very graciously, began his inaugural address 40 years ago um, by expressing thanks to his predecessor for all he had done to heal the country. Um, four years later, of course, the, the tables had turned. Um, Carter was desperately uh, waiting to hear about the release of the American hostages in Tehran. The Iranians, uh, in a final twist of the knife, were determined not to release those hostages until the new president uh, was sworn into office. But, um, you know, there are some obviously very dramatic moments on Inauguration Day, and sometimes the drama uh, revolves around the personal relationship, and yes, sometimes the personal animosity of the incoming and outgoing chief executive. I have one final question tonight, and if uh, we're going to take uh, make time for audience questions, as we always do with our virtual programs, I'd like to remind everybody, if you have a question for Richard about the Trump presidency, uh, please uh, email us at dolequestions at ku.edu, dolequestions at ku.edu. Richard, we talked at the outset about the perils of a historian stepping up to the plate so soon after a presidency. <laughs> How long do you think it will be before a, a serious historian steps up to the plate and writes about President Trump? Well, let, let, me, um, let me amend that. Uh, there, there is no shortage of serious, well-regarded historians who, in fact, have written about the Trump presidency, um, uh, you know, and they haven't taken off their their historians at, but uh, but I know I know what you're saying in terms of uh, how long will it be in effect before we have the detachment that is traditionally viewed as necessary uh, to provide a uh, objective, quote unquote, assessment of someone. Uh, Richard Nixon famously said it would be 50 years before people could write objectively about him. And it's coming up on 50 years. Um, I, again, I don't mean to evade the question. The problem is there is so much that is uh, that is hanging out there. There is so much politically. We don't know if four years from now there will be a Republican Party. 
as we know it, uh, whether there will be a Trump party, a Patriots party, a, a Freedom party, whatever, whatever name it might go by. Um, we are in the midst of history making and um, that, that alone, I think, um, should, should sort of put us on guard before uh, predicting um, when we will have put the history sufficiently in the rearview mirror. But it's certainly, um, it, it, it's, it's going to be a while. Uh, and I would argue, but I also I have to say, again, to be to be put this into perspective, um, there is something about the American political process, the American political culture, the broader culture, um, that has led to a series of polarizing presidents. Uh, I mentioned the number earlier about 46% and 26%, uh, both very high numbers in effect, um, uh, both I think uh, testament to the intense um, emotions that are being felt um, even as we even as we speak. Um, and it, again, that didn't begin with Donald Trump, um, Bill Clinton, was a polarizing president, uh, certainly George W. Bush, Barack Obama. Um, I would go back and say Ronald Reagan, who, who again, we, we tend to uh, uh, sort of deify, uh, you know, after the fact. Um, and, and he's certainly a historically significant uh, uh, weather changing president. But precisely because he was such an agent of change. And maybe that's, that's part of this. Um, the, the, you know, Woodrow Wilson once said, if you want to make an enemy in Washington, try to change something. Well, uh, Bill Clinton represented a significant change culturally, stylistically, from the World War II generation embodied in um, the first President Bush. Um, George W. Bush certainly represented a significant uh, change policy-wise um, and stylistically um, from Bill Clinton. And, and certainly Barack Obama was elected in some ways amidst the economic crisis and, and war in the Middle East um, as the un-Bush. Uh, and, and certainly the, the country took uh, a dramatic turn in an opposite direction in 2016 when it elected uh, Donald Trump. So, so you have this trend. It's more than a trend, I guess, now. It's become almost a tradition of, uh, just as you notice, we tend to change Congresses every two or four years. Well, um, you know, the, in Rome, famously, there used to be what was, well, still is, what was called somewhat irreverently the fat pope, thin pope theory, which meant that each pope represented, in many ways, the opposite of his predecessor, uh, in part because they, they tend to stay in office long enough to, to put a stamp on the institution. And putting a stamp on the institution uh, invariably raises the hackles of those who uh, would prefer to go in a different direction. And uh, the College of Cardinals uh, reflects that fact. Maybe we've, we've imported the fat pope, thin pope theory um, in choosing our presidents. Okay, we've got questions from the audience for you now. Richard, uh, Clarence asks, do you see a center-right party being formed in the near future in reaction to Trumpism? There are certainly a number of people who would who would uh, volunteer for such a party, um, but the numbers, uh, and again, you know, this was all very very preliminary. Um, if poll after poll after poll uh, suggests that um, what we call the Republican Party is very much Donald Trump's party, 
Uh, he is the dominant figure. Um, a majority of Republicans say they want him to be their nominee in 2024. A majority say uh, that they would follow um, him, uh, for example, as opposed to, say, Senator McConnell, um, the majority or former majority leader, aspiring majority leader uh, in the United States Senate. Um, the question is, if a majority of the existing Republican Party and a substantial slice of unaffiliated voters, particularly voters uh, who perhaps um, came out of the woods, as it were, uh, to vote for Donald Trump. Um, the, the fact is, those numbers put together may very well overwhelm the uh, f fraction of more traditional, if you will, uh, conservative Republicans, what used to be called country club Republicans, Wall Street Republicans, uh, neocons. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan's genius politically was to hold together a disparate coalition, primarily but not exclusively, quote, conservative, um, including elements of the electorate who today are loyal to Donald Trump. Uh, and at the same time, uh, appeal convincingly to a majority of independents and even poach uh, some, some Democrats. Um, that was the genius for Franklin Roosevelt in his time. The, uh, the New Deal coalition was uh, a, a crazy quilt gathering of big city bosses and Southern racists and um, labor unions uh, and uh, brain trust intellectuals, um, African-Americans fleeing the, the party of Lincoln. Um, and, and what held them together? Franklin Roosevelt. What held the Reagan coalition together? Ronald Reagan. Uh, and now there is a Trump coalition. And it will be very interesting to see if it outlasts Donald Trump, if it can be inherited, for example, by members of the Trump family or those who are members of the ideological Trump family. But your question about a center-right uh, party, in effect, um, a Republican party seceding from itself, by all means, there's the urge to create such a party. Uh, I have real doubts as to whether there are numbers um, and ideas to sustain such a party um, as anything other than a third party. Tyler asks, in the past, the ex-president's club has welcomed new members with more or less open <laughs> arms. Do you believe the club will welcome 45 or shun him based on his prior attacks on them? Well, you're, actually, the, the, uh, what Herbert Hoover called our exclusive trade union has not always been uh, welcoming. Um, Hoover and Truman used to jokingly uh, debate among themselves whether they would let Ike uh, become a member. Um, I think the, the question goes both ways here. Uh, I, I, certainly, you, you could ask the question of whether the existing members of the of the of the exclusive trade union uh, want to have Donald Trump hanging around. But I think it's at least as likely, indeed, probably more relevant as to whether Donald Trump has the slightest bit of interest in, in joining uh, such an organization. You know, if you saw him, for example, at President Bush's funeral, um, he was not comfortable. Um, that was not his manure. And, um, you know, the former presidents tend to get together infrequently at funerals and library dedications. It will be very interesting to see, for example, uh, you know what? We may not be able to answer this question until there's a Trump library um, and a, a dedication of a Trump library to see who's invited and who shows up. Well, that's a perfect setup for the next question. 
Mark asks, as an architect and consultant for presidential libraries and centers, what do you think a Trump library or center will look like? What will my grandchildren learn from visiting this site? <laughs> well, it's a good question. Uh, and and I, I, I pause because um, I, I'm, I'm asking myself, is this one area where convention will in fact uh, win out? In other words, there's a formula uh, for presidential libraries. Uh, it's evolved over time. Most of them, of course, today are located on college campuses. Um, I would think the number of universities that would... Um, petition for a Trump library would be limited. Uh, I'm sure there are some, but that that's one factor that I think perhaps might set it apart. But that said, the, the formula, of course, is that you build a, a, a museum, a permanent exhibit, uh, which as a rule tends to uh, make a present look pretty good. Um, and you have an archive uh, where uh, scholars can do scholarly research. Um, and over time, uh, the institution reaches out uh, increasingly to the, to the community, um, school kids, as well as scholars, um, you know, becomes an economic asset, for example, for the region in which it's located. Anyway, all of those factors come into play. Um, and, you know, it is said that the former president is thinking of, um, of raising a ton of money to build a, a Trump library in Florida. Um, one thing that um, it, it'd be interesting to see, well, there's a lot of things that'd be interesting to see. It's all speculative. But as we've talked about in the past, modern presidential libraries have evolved so that in addition to the library and the museum, there is a third component. Um, beginning with Jimmy Carter, there's a center, uh, which is really it's the, the post-presidency presidency. It's, um, it's the, the, uh, the office complex, uh, the meeting ground, um, the, uh, the public platform uh, from which a former president uh, can pursue in, quote, retirement, many of the interests um, that, um, that he made priorities when in office. And if you think of the, the Carter Center, and it's, it's work, you know, combating disease uh, around the world or uh, as election monitors uh, around the world. You think of the Clinton Foundation uh, and the, the, the Clinton Center. Um, and, and now, likewise, the uh, George W. Bush uh, Presidential Library has a major uh, Bush Center. They often also are attached to schools, schools of politics, schools of public policy. So there, there are these hybrids. There are academic, tourist attractions, uh, archival research centers, and in some ways breeding grounds for ideas and programs uh, that may carry a president's legacy um, long after he's left us. Um, would Donald Trump want to do all of that? I have my doubts. Um, my hunch is that he would want a museum um, that uh, is um, all about him uh, and, uh, and he'll let others worry about the, the, the scholars and the public programming. Olivia asks, you alluded to this idea earlier in the evening in commenting that Trumpism exists without Trump. But in your opinion, would Trump be better described as a cause or as a symptom? Interesting. Um, I think Donald Trump very shrewdly, and, and in fact, in a way that was underestimated by many people, um, perceived trends in this country, demographic trends, cultural trends, resentments of those trends, 
Um, there are millions of Americans, no doubt, who feel that the country, their country, if you will, the country they knew growing up, um, that that country no longer exists or, or is in danger of, uh, of being taken away. Um, look, all parties appeal to some degree to people's resentments, even when they're taking pains to cloak that fact in an appeal to their ideals. Um, in the case of, of Trumpism um, and its namesake, uh, the appeal to ideals is 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 less uh, is less apparent, and the open appeal to resentments uh, is uh, is harder to miss. Clarence asks, and this is a, a tough question, Richard. How do you feel about Bob Dole being the only living Republican presidential nominee? to endorse Donald Trump in the 2016 election? I think it was, uh, uh, I have to say, I think it was predictable in this sense. By the way, uh, not to sound defensive, but I would uh, uh, presume to uh, add a clause onto that question that Bob Dole was also, I think, probably the most prominent Republican um, to um, declare that Joe Biden in, had, in fact, been elected president uh, and would be taking the oath of office uh, legitimately on January 20th. Why did Doe endorse Trump? Of course, he endorsed him in 2016. I, I, will, I have, um, for over 40 years, uh, made it a practice not to... Uh, talk about or speculate about um, my friend, uh, Bill's friend, and uh, at, at times our boss. Um, I have a theory, which I don't think I'm, it's just my theory. Um, I think Senator Dole had and has, whether it's right or not, that's up to you, but has a profound sense of gratitude to the Republican Party. Um, you know, he's of a generation of people, particularly maybe in Kansas, who uh, define themselves, you know, um, in in a number of ways. You were uh, you were a Methodist for life. You were a Republican or or Democrat for life. Um, you were in some ways you were emotionally branded. Uh, but beyond that, if you stop to think, he spent his entire adult life in the Republican Party, campaigning for the Republican Party, um, competing, uh, you, you might say, for, for its honors. And the fact that in 1996, that party should bestow on Senator Dole um, the greatest honor uh, in its power to bestow I think um, bred uh, an emotional uh, sense of emotional obligation almost that transcends the candidate. Uh, and again, you know, any one of us might um, uh, act differently, but none of us can put ourselves in his shoes. One final audience question what, tonight. By the way, Bill, uh, what, what do you think? Let me turn the table. What's, uh, what, you know, you, you, you've known Senator as long as I have. Yeah, I, I would agree with you 100%. I think it was out of loyalty to the party. And um, I think he was noticeably quiet during the election. I have one more audience question from Susie, who asked if you would like to run the Trump Library. I think I know the answer to that one. <laughs> that presupposes that so I would be asked <laughs> to run the Trump Library. Now, you, you have to remember, I have had some some pretty bizarre experiences uh, in the in the process of uh, being asked to run libraries. Uh, you know, Rod Bogoyevich recruited me to run the Lincoln Library 
in Illinois, um, um, you know, and his predecessor, who, who sort of got the place off the ground, uh, went to jail. Uh, and then Rod went to jail, by the way, to, to be bipartisan. One was a Republican, one was a Democrat. That, that, you know, that doesn't matter in Illinois. Um, I discovered uh, fairly early that the, uh, the secret to success in Illinois government is, is knowing when to get out, usually before the indictments arrive. And, uh, and I, I just you know, managed, managed the trick. So I'm not sure I would want to uh, 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 risk uh, repeating history uh, even assuming that there is anyone in the Trump organization who would uh, who would entertain the notion, it's in Richard, other words, uh, it's a it's a non-starter any way you look at it. Okay, Richard. Uh, next week we're going to get back together at seven o'clock, and you're going to discuss your rules for a successful presidency. But we're also going to do something you've wanted to do for a while called Ask Richard. Are you going to be open to taking questions about any president next week? Absolutely. If, you, if you've ever laid awake at night uh, wanting to know uh, intimate details of uh, Zachary Taylor's uh, love life, then uh, be in front of your set next, next Tuesday. And I would encourage members of the audience, if you've got those questions, you can go ahead and send them to us at dolequestions at ku.edu. And we will try to get to as many audience questions as we possibly can. Richard, thanks for a terrific program tonight. Thank you, Bill, as always. It's a pleasure. And, and again, I have to tell you, because um, I as you know, do this from time to time, uh, your questioners are the best in the business. Thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate that. We always get great audience questions, so very proud of that. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Like I say, I encourage you to join us next week at 7 p.m. Uh, for Richard's discussion of his rules of successful presidents. And also ask Richard, where you can ask any question about any president and it'll have a chance of being asked next week. Go ahead and start submitting those questions right now. But thank you very much for joining us, and we hope to see you next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Have a great evening. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this evening. If you are a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Next week, we look forward to hosting Richard Norton Smith again on Tuesday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. for the fourth and final installment of the presidential lecture series, What I've Learned. This program will feature an extended Q&A with Mr. Smith, and you can access it on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel, just like tonight's program. Refer to doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming programs. We hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you and good night. Susie.